Good evening. <laughs> have to have a little energy from the audience, right, to get going around here. So um, I always start by talking about my nickname in America, which is Jag, like in Jaguar. And ever since that association, I've been dreaming of owning a Jaguar with a license plate, Jag's Jag. Actually, the dream became reality five years ago when I turned 60. I just finished 65. And uh, my children both grown up. My daughter is a professor with me. And they surprised me on my birthday. I don't count my birthdays. Saturday morning, I went out, got the paper, turned around, saw this beautiful top-of-the-line Jaguar parked in the driveway. It must be late at night with a handwritten license plate, Jag's Jag. <coughs> it was a rent -a car. So I learned to lower with, uh, you know, you can be happy with lower expectations, right, by and large. <clears throat> Pretty much that's my background in some fashion. The topic today we are going to talk about, I think, is very critical for the rising sun. If you go back to the history, in 1800s we created two super economic powers. The first half was uh, Germany, the uh, second half became America, so I mean uh, England. If you go back to 1900s, you had the U.S. became the dominant economic power. In the second half, surprisingly, Japan came into existence. In the 21st century, we clearly see the two powers emerging, dominating the economic scene of the world will be China and India, will become great athletes a running race against each other by and large, and we see enhance the excitement about India for the rest of the world. And in fact, we are trying to articulate how India can become in the world scene in some fashion or the other. In the meanwhile, India has a number of challenges to manage. The biggest one, in fact, as the title of the presentation talks about, is staying ahead of the curve. So let's talk about where the need for this staying ahead as a phenomenon becomes necessary. First of all, we really don't have any more protectionism, and the license raj is basically gone. I don't think we'll go back to that. We have a complete geopolitical realignment of India taking place. Out of nowhere, we see a significant alignment of India with the U.S. economy. The alignment has begun primarily on the military side, but it will have enough economic consequences. India and U.S. will become one of the largest trading partners, just like Mexico has become. Mexico now surpassed China. $200 billion of trade is done with Mexico, mostly through the outsourcing theory. Parts of things Mexico does, so Mexico imports products from India, let's say raw materials, makes finished products and ships it back to America, and that trade surpassed China, which was number two, and we think more and more U.S. economy will buy less and less from China and will steer that economy more and more toward Mexico and toward India by and large. And I think that is, that is going to have a significant impact on the future of India. Rapid economic growth is already taking place. This kind of an alignment will fuel that economic growth even more. We have increasing foreign competition. <coughs> this is coming in two forms. First one, of course, is more and more the WTO phenomenon coming into the place, and therefore more imports will come by and large as it is happening in steel, as it is happening in aluminum, for example, as it is happening in luggage, as it is happening in consumer electronics but also large foreign companies will invest their capital and make things around here, as we see in the automobile industry, for example, as we see in the appliances industry, whether they come from US, UK, Europe, Korea, China, wherever they come from. So I think Indian industry will experience significant amount of uh, offshore competition. At the same time, consumer expectations are rising in India. <coughs> as you would expect, with liberalization of the market, as people travel a lot more, experience different things. Media now are accessing information from a worldwide basis, 24 hours, 7 by and large, and therefore consumer expectations are rising in the process about quality of products they buy, about services they encounter, etc. And I think that is also going to have an impact about how do we stay alive or how do we stay ahead of the curve by and large. And the last area is a very key consequence. This country never really has a scale on any industry that I know. We may talk about scale, but our scale is very minimal. If you take software as an example, if you put together all of our software companies, they don't add up to the size of IBM Global Services alone. Now, if you take IBM Global Services, if you take EDS, for example, if you take Accenture, 
these are much larger in scale so one of the biggest weaknesses of this country is scale it does not have the scale and the only way you can create scale is not natural growth or sort of a home grown phenomenon but the scale you can create in fact is by significant amount of merger acquisitions activities so i do believe that shakeouts will take place in india as we go forward pretty much all of the capability all of the signs of a shakeout are pretty much in place as i will articulate in the, in the, in the second chart that i have but let's just talk about a little more one of the largest consequences of the way we go organize this economy since independence by and large is surprisingly the unorganized sector if you take luggage industry even today more than 60% of the luggage is done by unbranded product makers there is no branding at all whatsoever if you take even pc business more than 40% of the pc produced in india assemble is unbranded what is known as white boxes in comparison to let's say wipro brand of pc or hcl brand of pc and what is imported by and large <coughs> check out is very very necessary because of the following things we have a dominant unorganized sector across industries by and large what one would be calling as a small scale sector no economies of scale lack of standards is another very big event taking place we are now putting some standards through maybe government regulation let's say standards on food quality adulteration standards on in fact uh, beverages for example lack of scale that i talked about quite a lot low entry and exit barriers so far it is relatively easy to enter a market in the into the indian context and get out of the market without getting too much hurt in the process that that basically is a first sign of a shake out of an industry lack of market makers there are no real distribution companies that could be market makers there are no real giant retailers that could be market makers uh, in us for example walmart is a major market maker for anybody walmart is such a huge buyer that they, if they open up their market pretty much any major supplier can become a multi million if not a multi billion dollar enterprise very quickly we also have a very strong herd mentality and i found this to be true not only just in the dot com phenomenon but any phenomenon if there is a new concept in retailing that is emerges everybody else wants to join into the retailing business if we have a bpo concept emerging we all go into the bpo business and in the process the industry gets commoditized very quickly which is another reason why shake out takes place by and large <laughs>
unprofitable product line. So profitability peaks at about 40 to 45 percent market share. Number two company usually has 20 percent market share, and number three company usually about 10 percent market share. It works like a clockwork in every economy, every industry that I've analyzed by and large. If the three full line generally temporarily do not concentrate 70 percent of the market, there is a room for a fourth full line player, so long as each one has at least 10 percent market share. So 10% has become a magical number to be a volume-driven company. Otherwise, you should remain a niche-driven company. And I see in the Indian economy, through consolidation and shakeout, we will see more and more of the emergence of the scale-oriented, large-scale players. In fact, the rule of three prevails in India very quickly, I can tell you, the domestic airlines. Remember domestic airlines? As it was opened up, <coughs> and the domestic airlines, in fact, we had early start casualties. East-West Airlines, there are a bunch of names, and now we see the rule of three in place pretty much. Jet Airways, number one, Indian Airlines, which is surviving as an incumbent monopolist, number two, and Sahara is number three. Then you see niche guys out there. Only short haul, let's say, between Bangalore and Chennai, something like that. Those airlines also will come into play as market becomes more and more deregulated by and large. Where do you make money? Money making is always at the two extremes of the market size or the market scale by and large. This is a chart that we have found to be true across all industries by and large. On the right side are the volume driven players. They are scale oriented. Number three company is very close to that uh, ditch as a phenomenon that I talk about. Left side are all the niche players by and large and you see the reverse curve. Smaller the market share, greater the profitability. And generally a company on the left side, very small super niche company begins to grow because it is so profitable, they're all margin driven players, wants to grow the volume and it collapses in the process. Generally this collapse is very predictable and they go into the ditch. The ditch is the worst place to be in and therefore strategy is very simple. Whoever is closer to the ditch is very likely to go in the ditch and therefore strategy is to say stay away from the ditch, make up your mind. Do you want to be a scale-oriented company or you want to be a niche primarily company? You make money at two extremes. And generally what happens is that as the industry matures and struggles on the right side for survival, a lot of market share fights take place, the niche companies grow at the same time. With this we see in cement in India right now, for example. This we see in cellular telephone quite a lot in India, for example. Rule of three is likely to prevail. So this I think is one very key area that we need to identify. By the way, surprisingly, number three company is always most innovative, not number one or number two. Chrysler always led the industry revolution in automobile industry. So did RC Cola, not Coke or Pepsi. Number one, number two companies usually have the largest R&D dollars, but they do not take their inventions into commercial innovations. It is number three company who starts the trend, and number one, number two companies usually follow that very quickly. Number three company is usually closer to the ditch also. <clears throat> In fact, the survival strategy depends not so much as what they do, but depends upon what happens to number one and number two companies. If number one and number two companies fight for market share in a stagnant market <clears throat> or a stagnant economy, usually number three becomes the casualty. So for example, when General Motors and Ford fought for market share in the 70s after the energy crisis, Chrysler became the casualty. When McDonnell Douglas and Boeing fought for market share when airlines were not buying aircraft, Lockheed became the casualty. When McDonnell Douglas and uh, when uh, Boeing and uh, Airbus began to fight for market share in the late 80s, again, second round of uh, casualties, McDonnell Douglas became the casualty. For a while, you see rule of two prevail, but third company always emerges through consolidation, shakeout, etc., by and large. So we are watching the implication of this theory into, in fact, the Indian context. And it looks like there is an overwhelming evidence across about eight, ten industries that I've analyzed that rule of three in India is likely to prevail as we go more and more toward a market-driven economy, allowing, in fact, full force of competition to come in by and large.
Next area is called target costing. The old idea used to be that I aggregate all my cost, uh, cost accounting people will tell us, and then I need my margins, so we always, uh, price is the residual of cost plus, whatever cost plus, whatever margins I need to command. Target costing is the opposite, it is price minus. In a competitive market, the idea is that the price will be set by the marketplace, not by you. And prices will be declining over time in a non-inflationary time period. Let's say on the average, 5% decline in the prices, if there is no inflation in an economy. How do you make money, therefore? The idea around it is that you need to create a process of cost management, not price increases. That's called target costing. The practice began in Japan, primarily in the automotive sector, which they have been masters at this game, it looks like, by working with suppliers to get the cost out as much as possible rather than a cost shift, it is a cost elimination through a process approach. And the companies that are doing very, very well in target costing are companies like Walmart as retailers, pretty much. Uh, Walmart has grown to now about $250 billion corporation. In the next about three to five years will be $500 billion corporation. And as the vision to become the first trillion dollar retailer in the world, it is mind boggling. But Walmart provides that value to the customers. And they make money by having suppliers lined up in a way, collaboratively working with the suppliers, they get the cost out. They are, by the way, the largest book retailers now. They are the largest film processing company in the world now. It just goes on and on. Any product Walmart touches, they are a market maker and become number one or number two very quickly. In fact, Walmart goal is that any product category they carry, they will be number one or number two maybe number three starting position in the rule of three theory that I talked about. Walmart is a very key example. Third is another great example in the manufacturing sector. They have been constantly able to have market to concept timeline reduce. It used to be about 60 months worldwide. All American car makers, Japanese car makers used to have 60 month cycle. Honda was the first one to drop the cycle to 36 months. Ha, Toyota always watches number three company, Honda. They duplicated that one. And today Toyota can roll out from concept to the market an automobile in about 24 months and declining, which is a cost reduction mechanism by and large. And the last one is that very key thing that can happen is store brands. Store brands have an enormous power. One of the key powers we are finding in retailing is the following, that retailers have now today for, for the first time the power to create their own brands and then sell it to a manufacturer. Usually manufacturers created brands and sold it to the retailers. What I find more interesting is a reverse process where a retailer is a market maker, therefore creates a brand name, but they don't own the brand in the long run, they get a valuation by selling the brand. Again, target costing in retailing, store brands as an area is a very, very powerful. Last area for creating a price value for the customer is credit financing. And this is coming in India in a big time. India eventually will get away from the cash economy and more and more a credit economy for the consumer market. Credit cards will come much more universal around here as it is in the rest of the world by and large. And therefore credit financing is very key in capital goods such as buying Boeing aircraft or buying Airbus, for example. In fact, they bring in a consortia of financing people in the middle, including lease agreements. These are all financing deals, financing arrangements that you can make. And of course, very large infrastructure projects like building highways or building dams or building factories even, or townships by and large, special economic zones. You need enormous amount of capital. Financing becomes the key ingredient for success in the marketplace. Last area is how do you become customer friendly? And customer friendly comes from four areas in our processes. The first one is easy access. How can you make easy to do business with through access approach by and large? So you talk about companies like Amazon.com, 24 hours 7. You can go to their website. The website is very user friendly. Many of the airlines, by the way, I'm finding it fascinating. Delta Airlines that I fly quite a lot because I live in Atlanta. Delta Airlines, actually it is so easy to do business on their kiosk at the check-in place at the, uh, at, the, at, the, at, the, at the airport. You don't want actually the check-in person to help you out. The computer does a superior job. No errors, no mistakes. It is again a platform, a computerized reservation system 
Probably it is the best CRM platform I've seen in any country. Customer relationship management, we talk about CRM. It's much better in the airline business than any other business that I've seen. And they are able to do it very, very well. The whole web commerce that is emerging, pretty much, if you talk to companies like Cisco or Dell Computers, most procurement done by business customers is on the web. Again, they do mass customization on the one hand, but easy access is the other one. Asymmetry of transactions. The buyer can call in at one time and the seller does not have to be present at that time, makes it much easier to do business by and large. And the last combination, easy access, is what we call a combination of brick and clicks. Standalone uh, retailing online is not going to succeed except a few companies like Amazon.com or eBay, for example. There are a lot of casualties. But if you take a traditional retailer and you offer the customers the choice, any way you can access the store, you can come and shop, you can order it on the telephone and pick it up, or we can deliver, in fact, by and large. I call it the pizza industry model. Pizza industry does that way. You can go and eat in a pizza restaurant like a pizza hut. You can order it and take out, simply pick it up because it's convenient, or they will deliver at your home. That is brick and clicks, by and large. Just make it easy access. Access is the biggest issue with our customers. Customers generally find that access to uh, just reaching the pro uh, entity is a, such a hard process, by and large. So make it easy through technology, if possible. Second one, of course, is rapid response. That once the customer shows up at your doorstep, how fast do you do the business with them? Cycle time kind of a concept. And around here, again, airlines dominate because uh, you can do the transaction instantly, pretty much. And other companies are trying to organize the whole CRM revolution that is taking place is primarily organized around a rapid response so that using the web technology as much as possible, one can do. A third area of rapid response is to empower the front line of people. More and more, if you give empowerment to the frontline people to make decisions, you can accommodate all of the differences of consumer customers coming in the marketplace or business customers coming in the marketplace. So empowerment becomes another very key issue. I better stop here. I hope you have enjoyed. I have enjoyed very much. Thank you very much. Thank you.